Um, it's, uh, oh. Oh, one sec. We might be able to get it to work. But it doesn't do anything. Oh, that's why it wasn't. One, two, one, two, check. All right. All good, perfect. You can just flip it up. I'll also be able to record from the back with this. All right, thank you. Good morning. So, my name is Mark. I work at a company called Emma. Uh, what I do is try to take care of the Postgres database servers that we have. Anyone heard of Emma before? Um, Emma is an e email marketing company. We provide, uh, we're a software as a service. We provide a web app that you can use to manage uh, email lists, uh, create marketing campaigns, and to track some basic statistics on people who open, read, and click forward, and so forth. So I'm here to tell a little story about some fun we have with changing a data model around our member information. Um, how uh, all the fun that we had and, and how we're getting through it all. The member information, what, what we call our member information, it really is just the list of emails and a bunch of attributes that, that we allow each client to, um, to uh, define a list of attributes that they want to want to follow. So, so some simple examples are you know, first name, last name, and what your favorite database is. Of course, you can add things like birth dates or favorite color and so forth. So Emma's been around for about 10 years. And uh, once upon a time, when they got started, they decided to partition their databases, or partition the database, based on, well, for each account. Each account had uh, about 14 tables each. And um, the member information, the, this is going to what I'm going to talk about is mostly going to be around getting their member information back out of the database. So the exporting of their data was, was really simple because all the member information was always in a single table. So here's an example. If I was emailing all the core members of the Postgres, uh, Postgres core team, I would have their email address, their first name, last name, and, and their favorite database in the table. For those of you who are in here, did I get your favorite database right? Oh, come on, let me edit that. All right. Yeah, okay, I'll have to fix it later. So what was wrong? Uh, we eventually had over 40,000 accounts in the, in the database. It made it a little bit of hard to mine some data. We ended up with over a million objects in the system catalog. And whenever someone wanted to change, add, or remove an attribute on that table, that table was used, was heavily accessed across the uh, application enough that doing an altered table statement on that would, would um, freeze up the application for everyone. So some of the simple data mining things that we, we couldn't do with the schema looking like this was uh, as simple as, well, how many marketing campaigns did people send out yesterday? Now, the, I think a real basic example is we got 40,000 tables. We, uh, would try to query something on a parent table, and we end up grabbing a little too many locks. We want to do anything more interesting, start joining tables together. We end up with you know, mul multiples of, of um, 40,000 locks and so forth. It made it also hard to, oh, yes. So it's like how far was the bow, was it? Um, it It, 
if no one else was doing anything on the system, it wasn't too bad. But that was rarely the case. Uh, usually, usually what would end up happening is someone would try to do something, realize that it took too long, and stop. Uh, there, n it wasn't always the case where someone did a query and and uh, clients started calling in and saying, "Why, why isn't the uh, app responding to?" It? But uh, and and a lot of people didn't didn't like going after each uh, uh, child table separately and having to go through a lot of that aggregation by hand. Uh, for, for the system administrators, what, what they didn't like was they would try to back up this data and because of how many, how many objects were in the system catalogs, it, it would take over a day to back up about a terabyte of data to take a dump of the whole system. And, and they weren't comfortable with doing this uh, other than over the weekend. And then we didn't have any, we had backups on a weekly basis, which, which other people were unhappy with. So we did something dramatic. A few years ago, I, I think a few years ago now, uh, the couple, of the, couple of the changes that, that we made to high, uh, couple of changes to highlight around how we dealt with our member information. We, we reduced the number of, of partitions by, by making, having a fixed set of tables, so 1,024, because we like those round powers of two. And, and we hashed all the accounts into them based on whatever their account ID was. So this reduced our, our data set, I suppose, for each partition to about one gigabyte of data. We also developed a homegrown Python middleware, middleware layer between the web server and the, and the database for a couple reasons, for, for providing a public ADI, API to clients and, and to hopefully make our development easier for the front end. Then we applied the entity attribute value data model to that member information table. How many data modelers do we have? All right. So how many people are familiar with, with what this data model is? How many of you are fans? All right. Um, so th this data model basically lets us um, avoid doing the alter table statements and lets Let's clients add and remove attributes they want to track by, uh, w which would result in simpler insert, update, delete statements. So going into this data model, that was the primary reason we chose it. We wanted to avoid those alter table statements. And we did know up front that we need to query the data differently and that strict doing strict type checking would be a little bit harder, like making sure strings are strings, dates look like dates, numbers are really numbers. Um, this data model consists of basically three tables. One that would have the, the email, the core member information, uh, the basically all information that, that a member really had to have to it in this case would really be just the email address. And then in the, another table to have all the attributes we were wanting to check, so that, that would be where the first name, last name, their database would be defined. <coughs> um, and then a third table, which would actually have the actual values of what the attributes were. Who likes ER diagrams? Uh, so this is mainly just a reference for some of the examples that we have up there. You, hopefully you can see that the member table, we have surrogate keys for, uh, that would help identify what the account is, what the member, or uh, a member ID for, as a surrogate for the email address. Uh, then on the far right, we have the field, what the type, uh, another surrogate key, uh, the name of it, which is, uh, which is actually the unique identifier of it. 
the order of which the columns or the attributes would appear when the clients are looking at their member information and uh, the type of field it, it is. Then in the middle, we have that member field table where we have a column for each type of data we were tracking. So if it were a Boolean, there'd be a column that's a Boolean, uh, a text column for the text fields and numerics and so forth. A couple of things uh, to note about the middleware layer is that we use SQL Alchemy at, to model the database. How many Python people do we have? You guys uh, fans of SQL Alchemy? Yeah. So, um, so in modeling that, modeling the database with with the SQL Alchemy ARM, we had decided to also pivot data uh, in the middleware layer. And um, we didn't want people dumping out their lists of millions of members at a time using uh, with with a public API call. So we also restricted that call to return only 500 members at a time. So if you had 4,000, uh, 4,000, 1,000 members, you'd be calling that four times to get all your data out of there. Does everyone know what a data pivot looks like? Simple ex example. So with with this EAV model, if we were to pull all the data out at the top there, uh, that's, that's what it would look like. You'd basically have a row for every attribute that you were tracking per member. So Josh's first name, Josh's last name, and his favorite database would all come back as separate rows. So then in that middleware layer, we would, we would do that pivot and turn it back, <laughs> rotate that data over so, so it looks more like, uh, well, typical spreadsheet or whatnot. Pretty straightforward so far? So to give you an idea of how much data our, our uh, clients have right now, this is a, a short survey of, of about eight accounts, our eight largest accounts. You can see that the number of members that they have range from anywhere from about 500,000 to almost four and a half million-ish. And the number of attributes that all of them have defined for their list. Um, what I did in the far right column is kind of multiply that out. The, the two right columns, one is the actual number of fields, that number of values that they actually have entered versus how many values that they could have. I, I found the value in the right, that was kind of a gut feeling. I didn't really do any, um, any real concrete, um, didn't really determine with any, any uh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. But I felt like that column on the far right seemed to have a bigger influence on how, um, how the query performance turned out coming up. So I have that up there. Who wants to guess how long it took for these guys to get their data out? Any wild guesses? Six hours. Six hours? Anyone want to do better? Ten minutes? Ten minutes? <laughs> no one got their data out. So we're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, we knew we had statement timeouts in Postgres set to one hour. And that's easy to disable. Then we found out that we were hitting the two or three hour timeout that Apache had. So um, we ripped the code out of the, of the app code just to run it outside of the web server just to see how long it would take. Then we found out that our network switches had a uh, three or four hour timeout on TCP IP connections. So we yanked all that code out and ran it on the database server just to see how long it really took to get it out of the database. For our two biggest accounts, uh, we gave up after waiting, I don't know, half a day. And finally, when we got down to an account with 650,000 uh, email addresses and 
the data eventually came out in four hours. So we decided that maybe the middleware, maybe Python shouldn't be pivoting data. Maybe we should have the database try to do a little more work. So who's familiar with, with uh, the table func extension? Anyone fans of the crosstab function? Uh, so Postgres provides this table func extension in part uh, to in the, in the distribution to, uh, which contains several functions, but the one in particular in this is, is crosstab, which will pivot the data. So I'll, I'll uh, spoil it a little bit for you, right, for this, for this portion. Um, Postgres does pivot data faster than Python, if you use the right function. So when we, um, when we uh, rewrote the, rewrote the uh, uh, query and, and started using that crosstab function and started getting customers their data, we realized we weren't doing it right. So uh, anyone ever, for you guys who use crosstab, anyone ever fall into this trap? So basically, if, if I added uh, Emma at Emma and said her database was, favorite database was MongoDB, but I didn't really have her last name since she doesn't really have one. Uh, the the crosstab, the cr these crosstab functions at the bottom, which take a single argument, will will uh, shift all data, or it, it won't. It's not capable of padding field values uh, that are null, so everything gets shifted to the left. Um, customers that are calling in asking why their data looked all screwy, wanted to make sure that we didn't break anything. So that was easy to fix. You know, use the right crosstab function. This one at the bottom, taking two arguments, will properly pad out the, the, the columns that, that uh, didn't have any values in it. All right, next quiz. How much faster do you think it ran? Any guesses? 50%, 50% faster than, than your six hour guess or the four hour? Guess? All right. Anyone else? One week. One week? That looks pretty good, right? The guys who couldn't get data got it out in 22 minutes. And the four hour guy um, came out in about 10 minutes. Still slower than the, than the minutes that people were used to originally, but you know, well, they, we, could, we could get them their data now. So yeah, much faster. Um, but for, for how, many, how many application developers? So um, if it wasn't obvious, now we can't use the ORM to model the data because basically you need to be able to model an infinite number of, of possibilities depending on what attributes clients had. So I had to make the guys uh, feel more, more comfortable with writing SQL. And oddly enough, or maybe not too surprising, you know, the, the guys with with hundreds of email lists that um, actually took a few minutes longer to get their data out. But that seemed to be a fair trade-off. But we still had some problems. In uh, experimenting with our, our growth, seeing how large of customers that we come out with, we found out that even using the crosstab function, if we had member lists somewhere between five and 10 million this, we couldn't get the data out uh, within 12 hours. Something was still taking too long. So at this point, we're looking at our data model choice and, and deciding that um, maybe this is a little too inefficient. And it, it was a little disappointing that, that uh, the performance of this guy started to really keel over you know, with only millions of rows of data. So we're striving to do better. We're wondering what to do. Um, we're trying to gather what our, trying to figure out what our, all our options are. 
And so the most common question that we get asked internally is, well, what if just pull that data out of, the, out of Postgres completely and try it somewhere else? Uh, so we'll, I'll entertain that question, but we'll, we'll model something a little different in Postgres. We'll worry about taking it out later. Any, anyone, HDOR users? Fans, also fans? All right. So, so HDOR is a key value, key value store in a column, that uh, special data type. It's uh, another extension that comes with Postgres. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons why we decided, I decided to try to use HDOR first was because um, a lot of people were wondering at Emma if something like Redis would be the, the best way to do something like this. So I thought this would be a nice way to model. Yes? We tried this in 9.0, oh, version 9. So some things we knew going in if we were going to move forward with HDOR. We don't get strict types anymore. Everything's a string. We can't get strong referential integrity constraints between the keys and the HDOR column and, and the fields that, that we have in our field table. And to give you an idea of how long ago we thought about this, this was at a time where <laughs> HDOR wasn't yet supported in Psycho PG2 or SQL Alchemy um, a couple years ago. but. I'm sure you're all aware now that, that it's in there. So for those of you who aren't familiar with HDOR, this is, start a start, this is what it looks like if you just uh, look, pull the data out, see what's in there. Pretty straightforward. You got your email address, your, our unique identifier. Then in this HDOR column, we have the key value pairs of the first name, last name, favorite database. Um, then, took a little exercise to try to see how long it would take to convert all that data. Any, any guesses of, anyone want to take guesses of how long it took to, to take one gig of data and redo it all in HStore? Three days? 15 minutes? Oh, sorry, what? Two hours? 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Didn't you already, didn't you already guess? <laughs> One dollar. <laughs> took about two minutes to um, convert, to take one of our one gigabyte partitions and, and convert all the data. I put this query up just for show, but I mean, it's really, it's really the two minutes that's important, unless someone wants to rewrite this for me. Um, so with HStore, our query for pulling out data kind of looks like how it did in, how it did originally. You know, we just scan one table, get their email address, and pull out all the field individually. All right, next quiz. Who wants to guess how long it took to, to start dumping da data out again like this? Ten seconds. Ten seconds? Anyone else? Close. <laughs> so what originally took a couple minutes, or probably even faster than minutes for this particular account, that took four hours, and then uh, with crosstab down to 10 minutes, and using something like HDOR to shove it all back into a single table, came back down to 15 seconds. Well. Um, Little proof of concept is nice. Uh, we've only looked at HStore so far. People at Emma still want to know if we should just pull that data out eventually. But um, that's where we are today, still trying to decide what to try next, where to go with that data. A couple ideas that have been thrown around at various places. Uh, we had suggestions for using crosstab to pivot chunks of data at a time. After seeing that it took only a couple minutes to, to convert data for an entire partition. Maybe we can convert data on the fly for an account. And well, basically, this is pivoting the data using HStore, or 
converting to HDOR as a way of pivoting data. Um, some people are concerned about whether it's, it's important to be able to still have uh, strict type checking with, with dates. Um, maybe use, find something that will use BSON. Um, still find something else other than Postgres to use. Maybe try another data model if one looks reasonable. And uh, I even got a suggestion to use XML to, to use DTDs and, and uh, check our types that way. So that was my story. Thank you for listening. But you haven't actually tried it yet? Uh, correct, we haven't tried it yet. I imagine it's probably not not dramatically different and probably much better with with what's coming up in in uh, nine four. Is there a question? Yes. Questions, comments, jokes, yes. Thank you.